Education is absolutely fundamentally critical in, in art. It's also really important to understand that you'll probably never know everything. The goalposts are continually changing. Uh, but it is a fascinating business to be involved in. I've spent pretty much my whole life looking at, at artworks. I've got um, a few degrees in fine art, paint myself and write and all that sort of stuff. So it's, uh, as, as Jeremy Kibble, who's a great friend of ours and an artist, has said, being an artist is uh, it's actually not a career choice, it's more of an affliction. <laughs> um, being, being an art, art dealer is a little bit the same. Um, it can be a lot of fun, and it is. Uh, Ken and I were talking about the other day. It's a, it's a, a lifestyle choice, which is pretty dynamic, certainly the way we deal with it. And I think if you are going to approach this, mate, you need to immerse yourself. So I would actively encourage you. I know some of you collect already. I would encourage you not to take my word for it or our word for it, but to look wide, read widely, go to the galleries and look at things. And not only us, but also the state and regional galleries, uh, sorry, the state and regional galleries and also the national gallery. Because it's quite interesting when you go over to something like uh, the Art Gallery in New South Wales and have a look at the Andy Warhols on the wall and have a look at the, the silver, the, the three Elvises. And when you, you, you know that that sold just late last year for around 120 million US, um, and it was, uh, when it was purchased originally, it was about 8 to 10,000 US. Uh, and it was only about 40 years ago. It kind of puts things in perspective. And it's probably an appropriate time to talk a little bit about the market, generally speaking. Uh, when we talk about where, where dealers and represent artists, that's where we will take a body of work, an exhibition by um, you know, an artist, from, I could say someone like Greg Shedd. If you work on it for most of the year, we'll put the work up, we'll say, well, this is the story, let's have the discussion, sell the work, it's collected. Uh, placed into uh, institutional collections or, or whatever. That's called the primary market. That's the first sale. Uh, the secondary market is where it gets traded. Now, if you're more investment leaning towards things, and I have this theory that um, I would really like all investors to be collectors, and I'm yet to meet a collector who hasn't kept half an eye on the investment side of it. So, um, because all collectors want to know that they're buying really well, but what is, what is it that makes an artwork both collectible and investable? Um, if you go straight out just to buy the investment, then you're probably going to hit a pretty nasty uh, road, road up there at some point. So it's really important when you are looking to collect and invest that you get some sort of connection. I think education is a really strong part of that too. There are good and bad things about the auction market. One of the good things about the auction market is that it is reasonably, and I say reasonably, transparent in that it's a room full of people, they put their hands up, they buy it, it's on the open market, etc. Now, all those results are then put onto various websites. And if you are really going to get involved in this, a website that you should subscribe to is a website called AASD, Australian Art Sales Digest. Now, one of the things you'll find out about us is that we're as transparent, more um, of a better term, we're pretty terrible lives. So, uh, so, one of the things about our, our dealing is, and one of the things about the market that's changing through the internet age, is that it's becoming a lot more transparent. Now, one error to, to be careful of is just pricing things by square inch. Because all artists, if they are artists, as opposed to production line um, people, you know, decorative, you know, whatever you want to call it, ordinary, um, uh, they'll have good days and bad days. Now that is so for Bill Whiskey, that's so for John Olson, that's so for Brett Whiteley. Brett Whiteley is a classic case in, 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 uh, to discuss. You know, Brett Whiteley on a good day was a magician with a, with a line. On a bad day, it was just pretty horrible. You know, now, and then you've got issues of problems. So when you're entering into the secondary market, problems is absolutely critical. There's been a lot of high profile examples in the press in recent years, Blackmans, Whiteleys, uh, and even if they've gone through auction, people would feel, oh, that's really certain, but it's actually, you've got to look for further, uh, you've got to ask the right questions, particularly on the dealer and also on the auction. 
And those questions are things like, well, what actually happened to the work? ASD is useful because you can go back and you can see, oh, it's actually popped up at auction three or four times. And if a work has traded several times over a bunch of years, why is that the case? And a really good example of that is a work by Whiteley uh, called uh, Archie Under the Shower. It's traded something like seven times in the past 10 years. It's gone up to a million dollars. It hit the front page of newspapers uh, for doing so. It went to 1.5, it came back to 500. It's been going back up again. It's traded literally like a yo-yo. I personally think it's a terrible pain. Um, it's big, it's blue, it's a mood of his daughter under a shower, you know, so, and there are parts of it which are pretty unstructured. So from a, in, in a way you can comfortably say if it was a beautiful <coughs> central nude, it should be two million dollars, no problem at all. But really, it's a big blue, only just shower scene, and consequently it's been traded so many times. So the only thing to be done for that painting, in my opinion, with that work is it's bought by someone and it's put away for a long time. Whiteley is the most expensive artist in, in Australian history. But the good thing about the auctions, and I can spend the whole night talking about that, and I don't want to, is that it gives you a bit of a rough guide on the estimate, but it's not the be all end all, because there are a lot of dealers like us out there that trade a lot of art, and we don't put it on ASD. We'll tell you quite comfortably what things were sold for, but we, we try to pray uh, by private treaty. A lot of auctions are now doing that as well. So from an auction, auction market point of view, there is buoyancy in, in the market. People are interested, they are buying, and that's not uh, a dealer's ringing the people up and saying, oh, I didn't, would you like to buy this? You know, this is turn up. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of people who are going to that auction in a couple of weeks time. There's another one coming up in Melbourne shortly after that. There seems to be a dynamism about this sector of the market which is really interesting. The, uh, the other thing to bear in mind too when you, you're talking about all of this is to keep our market in perspective of the world market. Buy quality, buy what you're interested in, be passionate about it and be driven less by fashion. Because if you, if you look at the, at the way the market has worked over many, many years, and I'm talking over 100 years, quality, not size, not... Um, not uh, you know, that it's painted in, in, in the nature of, uh, you know, uh, Leonardo da Vinci or, you know, addressing the perspective or what have you. If everyone just sort of slavishly went to that, there'd be no Picasso, there'd be no... I mean, from an investment point of view, there's always that the thing. It is a tangible asset. It is, it is something that, even if it goes down, even if it drops away for quite a few years, if you have bought well, if it has good provenance, if it is not driven by fashion but driven by quality, you have something that will start clawing its way back more than likely.